Good morning, everybody. I'm Leif Nelson, and thanks for coming to the Data Colada seminar series. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, George Lowenstein. And in addition to George, we have a bunch of great panelists, Shane Frederick, Andrea Isoni, Mina Jung, Robin LaBeouf, and Dor Murag. In addition to all of them, Joe Simmons and Yuri Simonson are with us here as they always are. For those of you who haven't been here before, the best way to interact with us during the presentation is to submit questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom panel. Those can be seen by all of us. And when we have a chance, we will go ahead and interrupt George and just ask those questions. But even if we don't get to your questions, they all get recorded. So don't worry, we can share that information with George and Dor after the talk. Uh, with all that in mind, George, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, this is a new paper and it's the first time it's being um, that I'm presenting it. And I had a hard time preparing for it today. So I didn't quite get it together. So I decided that instead of um, presenting the paper, I would show you some of my favorite New Yorker cartoons. Um, that was a nod to today's date. And, but the first part that I said is, accurate let me say a couple of other things um this um is a kind of economics paper and you probably know that the convention in economics is to list authors alphabetically and you can see that the authors are not alphabetical on this paper and that's a reflection of George, sorry. yes you are not yet sharing your slides oh thank you um Three, three, okay. Good, okay. Yeah, so you can see the, or the order of the authors in this presentation and on in the paper are, is not alphabetical, which is a very, is intended to be a very strong sign of the relative contributions of the two of us. Okay. Um, the paper is about um, the impact of narrative thinking on valuations, and hopefully you have had a um, time to read the quote from Jean-Paul Sartre. Okay, a narrative or a story places um, events on a timeline and establishes causal links between them. According to Aristotle, a narrative has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it's more effective when those events follow as cause and effect. Um, a narrative give mean, gives meaning to events by making them part of a whole. And narratives have been posited to serve a variety of functions to promote efficient communication, to aid in imagining the consequences of potential actions, to reduce uncertainty related stress, increasing increase in a sense of control by providing an explanation for events and also to enhance the feeling of meaning. Um, we all, um, I'm about to come to this, but like uh, Jerome Bruner has done a, bun a bunch of research on people's um, life stories. It turns out that if you ask somebody to tell you their life story, almost everyone has it ready at hand. And um, so we have these stories about our own life and those stories um, help us help to give our lives meaning. Uh, narrative thinking seems to be universal across cultures and it seems to begin in early childhood. It seems fairly um, universal. And narratives have been central to the creation of religion and culture, and they play a key role in shaping popular opinion. So in short, narratives are important. <clears throat> There's been a fair amount of research on narratives. I already talked to Bruner, and Bruner points out the importance of narratives, both for interpreting um, our own lives, but also for guiding our lives, like people try to conform to the stories that they create about their lives. Akerlof and um, Snower, um, they describe, it's a paper about macroeconomics. They describe seven ways through which narratives affect decision-making. I'm not going to go through, go through them, but you can read them again. 
um, Schiller has um, written books and discussed a lot the um, important role that narratives play in financial markets. And he documents what he calls narrative epidemics, where kind of a certain story about what's going on takes hold. And he, be he believes that these narratives play a big role in bubbles and busts. Elias and Spiegler have a theory paper, a recent theory paper in which they formalize narratives as a causal model that maps um, policy actions to national outcomes. They kind of use their model to understand phenomena like political um, polarization. And Schwarzstein and Sundram illustrate how technical analysis of stock data, which is kind of the opposite of what the title suggests. Technical analysis is when you ignore everything you know about the stock and you just look at um, the trajectory of the stock price and try to predict what it's going to do based on its trajectory. And they show how technical analysis um, can lead to clashing conclusions depending on um, what narrative the, view, the people who are viewing the stock prices are primed with. Pennington and Hasty probably did the seminal research, or they did do um, what I think is the seminal research on narratives. And they find that jurors are much more, um, are persuaded by narratives much more than just by kind of raw facts. And they study this by presenting jurors with the same facts, either in a temporal order, which kind of encourages them to form a narrative or in a kind of random order. And it turns out that the temporal order has a much bigger impact on the jurors um, than the kind of random order. Um, Izoni and um, Weaver and Frederick, so we have two of them here, which is great. Um, they argue that the endowment effect um, are, arises from people being bad deal averse, and they present a bunch of data um, for that. And you can think of the fear of getting a bad deal as fear of a certain kind of narrative associated with um, ownership or giving up an object or getting an object. And then I have an old paper with um, Sam Azakaroff on a phenomenon that we call source dependence. And we show that people value objects more highly when those objects are won in a game of skill. And we present two papers um, showing that. You can actually, if, if an object is a booby prize, if, it, if it's given to losers, then actually you get no endowment effect at all. And you could view this as a narrative effect. We don't in the paper, but thinking back on it, um, that um, there's the narrative is I got this object um, as a, um, result, a, a result of my good performance. That's a kind of a narrative. And that imbues the object with greater value and people display higher selling prices. Um, despite the appreciation, I, everything I just showed you shows that there's a kind of widespread spread appreciation of the importance of narratives. But surprisingly little work has examined the kind of empirical, empirically examined the kind of concrete consequences of narrow, narr narrative thinking in a systematic way. And we test the impact of narrative thinking on valuation in two incentivized experiments. Subjects in these experiments either um, generate, they um, either generate their own narrative for an object that they own. So these are two, or they list the object's um, characteristics. These are two important features of our experiments. They, people generate their own narrative. Unlike like in the paper I wrote with Sam Azakaroff, we gave them the narrative. That is, they got the object because of their good performance on a test or, an, or a contest. Here, the, set, the subjects are just telling us what their narrative is for an object. And another kind of unusual feature of these experiments, um, which I think distinguishes them from almost all endowment effect experiments is that um, we ask them to identify an object that they already own. And that's, that is the object for which we elicit selling prices or willingness to accept. Um, George? Yeah. 
I, I know you're going to get into the details, but I'm just curious in, in your thinking, is, is the content of the narrative the thing that matters, or is it the creation of a narrative itself that matters? And I, I guess I mean this in, as we think about, as I think about like my own possessions, I could tell stories about them as, as needed, but most of the stories would be uninteresting. And so I'm wondering, d does merely creating an uninteresting story like give me more attachment to the object or is it that interesting, the interestingness of the story is what creates that additional connection or valuation? Well, um, two reactions to that. One is that I'm going to show you some data relating to um, people, the impact of narratives versus listing characteristics for a significant object versus an insignificant object for people. And one of the surprising results um, to kind of give it away, but it surprised us is that the narratives have a bigger impact when they're connected with the insignificant uh, object. And you wouldn't think that like an insignificant object is going to lead to a very rich narrative. So we were really surprised by that result. And that kind of goes against the idea that the richness of the narrative matters. Um, it's also the case that we ran an early study that we didn't pre-register, so we replaced it with a new study. But in the, in the first study, in that first study, we did some analyses on the narratives themselves that we, um, we did a sort of a, a, well, a quantitative analysis of the qualitative narratives. And Dor, what did we, what did we find from that? Yeah, so um, we did find some associations between the evaluation and the narrative type, but the narrative effect was uh, robust to that. So it was not what what's uh, driven the, the difference between uh, between the conditions. Uh, so essentially, when we control for all sorts of narrative classifications, such, such as the type of personally. So I'm going to show you some data um, showing that uh, when objects are personally connected to an individual, that does tend to raise the selling prices. It's also possible that recounting the narrative might change the heuristic choice strategies used, used to generate the selling prices, the WTA evaluations. For example, recounting a narrative might lead people to use more holistic evaluations, uh, holistic strategies for evaluating the object that take account of considerations such as its meaning to the individual, its usage, or its fit with other possessions. Listing attributes, in contrast, might lead to more kind of attribute-based valuation strategies. And finally, the act of generating a narrative might trigger moods that could produce a change in valuations we think this is unlikely for reasons discussed in the paper. Um, and that includes that uh, when we did do the earlier study that's not part of the paper and we looked at whether the narrative was uh, positive or negative, we don't, or wasn't the case that we didn't find that positivity or negativity had a big impact on valuations. Yes, actually, so just uh, also in the current Two, two uh, studies that were presenting, we also did this analysis and also found uh, that result that uh, that, sa that sad versus uh, happy stories do not really affect, uh, affect valuations. The difference between um, the analysis we did here versus the older one is that in the older one, um, it was done by a research assistant. So someone uh, read the narratives and, and ranked them. Whereas in the, in the current two studies, it is self-reported by participants after, uh, after the multiple prices. So after they provided the valuation, they answered a series of uh, questions about, about the story and about the item. And, um, and yeah, so we, we also did this analysis on, on the-, the That's right. And, that, and it was possible to do that in the narrative condition, but not in the list condition. But in, the list con in both of the conditions, we were able to ask people after the fact, a lot of questions about the object, for example, its connection to other people, how they got the object, and so on. George, but, can, I jump, um, can I jump in and ask a question here, just regarding what Dor said? Uh, like, it seems inconsistent with what you found with the Zakharov 
like sad versus happy. You got this mug because you suck. You got this mug because you're amazing. It's a sad versus happy narrative and you thought it had big effects, but George just said you don't find that here. I was just curious. Right, so let me, sorry, George, for- <laughs> No, 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 absolutely. Yeah, so I think the main, the, the kind of the big difference here is that the most of the sad stories we observed in, uh, in, this, in this study is that people, you know, for example, talk about inherited objects, right? Or, or really big and meaningful event that happened to them that, that are also sad, but um, it was about, it was, so, you know, the narrative was still very meaningful, even though it was, uh, it was said where they think in, in the difference between uh, this and, and George and, uh, and George's oldest paper is that, um, you know, lo the losing narrative is, is, is different than a sad narrative, right? So it's, um, it's also di different in the, and how meaningful it is to the individual, but also different in deep, like, and how much you identify maybe with the story. And, and so I think there's a, I, I don't see it as, as contradicting George's. Uh, it might be, yeah, in the, old, in the old study, it might be meaningful, but meaningful in a way that people would rather forget about and not think about. Whereas if, it's, if the object is um, inherited, that is probably meaningful in a way that people would like to kind of retain. All right, here's the design of the study. There were two, there's two studies. The first was done with prolific workers. The second was done with MTurk workers. Actually, they were done in the reverse order, but we did the non-pre-registered study one, and then we replaced it with the pre-registered study. So um, both studies are pre-registered on the AEA um, RCT um, registry. Um, yeah, we would, the, one of the reasons I decided to present um, this paper to Data Colada is because I think we, we, we feel pretty confident about this. We, did, we didn't want to go to the home of um, the critique of p-hacking with a really weak set of studies. So, but you know, maybe I'll poke holes in them in the studies, but we think they're pretty strong. All right. So the subjects um, identified and provided a picture of an item they own without knowing why. That's it's important that they didn't know why, otherwise they could have strategically um, come up with an object that they didn't um, care about at all, and then um, sold and potentially sold it to us, maybe for a high price. In the first experiment, it was a mug that we instructed them should be it should be a mug of special significance to them. And in the second experiment, we were interested in whether it was important that the object was significant or not. So we used a hat, um, either of special significance or a miscellaneous hat. The reason we chose a mug was because that's kind of the standard object for endowment effect studies. The reason we chose a hat was because we were, uh, almost everybody owns a hat, first of all, and second, uh, most hats are very lightweight. And for the people who did end up selling us the objects, these are both like incentivized experiments. For the people who did sell us a hat, it was, they were cheap to stick in the mail and send to us. So as I already said, subjects were assigned to either, either list in bullet form the characteristics of the item, that's the list condition, or tell a story. That is how they came to possess it. That's the narrative condition. We elicited WTAs um, using a uh, multiple price list um, mechanism. We did that, that um, as opposed to a kind of classic Becker de Groot Marshak where people just state a price because the MPL is very intuitive to people. You know, choose, the, um, choose whether you want to sell at this price, at this price, at this price. And we're going to um, randomly pick one of the lines on which you make a choice and that choice will count. So it's very intuitive to people. Um, we asked three questions to verify their understanding of the transaction. My recollection is that we didn't kick people out if they answered them incorrectly, but we, they weren't allowed to proceed until they did answer them all correctly. Is that correct, Dor? Yeah, yes. he's nodding. So I'll say, uh, I think that is correct. Um, 
in experiment one, there was the maximum on the multiple price list in experiment one was a hundred dollars. But um, then we have, we observed that a hundred that a lot of the prices we were getting were um, above a hundred dollars, and in experiment two we raised it to three hundred dollars. Um, but there were larger um, intervals between the prices, so there were 40, 40 selling decisions for experiment one and forty eight selling decisions for experiment two. The moment the um, subject said. Let's say that they said, I don't want to sell it at 50 cents, but I do want to sell it at a dollar. Then all of the um, Qualtrics auto, auto filled out all the higher prices to be sell. But then I think we might have asked them a question verifying that, is this the price you want to sell it at? Right. Okay. For a subset of participants, um, the decision counted. We didn't, we told them for, in experiment two, we said um, for some of the subjects it will count, for a randomly selected bunch of subjects it's going to count, but we didn't tell them how many. And in experiment one, we said one out of 25 subjects. Um, the decision was randomly selected to be binding. So like if they said, I'll sell it to you at $50 and they were that that was the decision that was randomly selected to count, and they were the subject who was randomly deselected, selected to count. Then they would send us the object, and we would send them fifty dollars. In both the, both experiments, participants self-reported whether they bought the prize, received it as a gift. I'm not sure actually. That might have been the residual. Did we ask about received as a gift, Dor? We did. Okay. Um, inherited it or got it as a souvenir. We asked them to estimate its approximate kind of retail value um, to tell us whether it was custom made, how often they used it and how many years they owned it. Um, I have an old paper with Mikhail Strahilovitz on the impact of like how long you've owned an object on how much you value it. And the narrative condition only we asked them whether the narrative to, we asked them to evaluate whether the narrative was negative, positive, or both. George? George? Oh, go yes. ahead, go ahead, Leif. Uh, sorry, I'll, and then Joe, you can ask when my question's brief. I, to, what, to what extent is it possible that people think of different hats in different conditions? So if I'm asked to list bullet points, maybe I just say, oh, I'll, I'll describe my Oakland A's hat. But if I know I have to tell a story about the acquisition of a hat, I'm like, oh, well, wait a minute, let me go with the, oh, the one that I yeah, inherited. No, no, I'm really glad you asked that question because um, I didn't, ex I, I left out something really important from the um, design. We had them procure an object and we told them in the first experiment, it's either, it's a, um, a meaningful mug in the second experiment it's either a meaningful or unmeaningful hat. And we had them immediately take a picture of it with their hand in the picture. And they, um, the, the largest number of exclusions, which I'm going to get to in a second, was um, people who didn't do that um, properly. But they didn't, at the time that they did that, they didn't know what the point of the experiment was, but no, there was, um, it was a fixed object. They'd already told us what the object was and sent us a picture of it. So yeah, that, that, I'm very glad you asked that question. I think there was a second question. Um, yeah, I just had a, I was just very curious about the, the mug selling. So people actually sent you mugs in the mail and, they did. and did anyone who was supposed to sell their mug, you have it door. That's awesome. Did anyone who was supposed to sell their mug to you refuse to sell their mug to you after the fact? Dory will know about that. Yeah, so actually um, there's also a question in the in the chat about it, so I, I will answer it live. So um, yeah, there was, it was rare. I think there was only one were uh, supposed to send us the, the mug and it didn't, but uh, there are a lot of um, randomly, uh, so we randomly selected decisions and many of them were actually uh, ones in which participants did not want to sell, right? So uh, they answered no to the selected decision, and therefore um, we did not uh, we did not uh, buy the demand for them. But out of those uh, who did accept the selected decision, we only had one instance in which 
uh, the participant didn't send it back and they actually did, just did not, uh, we could not reach them. That was the problem. So we, they did not reply. We tried uh, many times and we just uh, could not reach, uh, re re recontact them. So that's uh, And how many mugs did you receive in total? So uh, in total, we, add, we have about uh, four months. Okay, cool, thanks. <laughs> Here's actually exam some example observations. That was the mug that Dora just held up for the camera. The, um, this is in the narrative condition. The narrative was, I grew up loving Mary Poppins. I would watch it over and over again until our VHS tape wore out and we had to get a new one. I saw this mug many times while visiting Disney World, but never let myself buy it. Then it went on clearance and became mine. That mug, that is the Mary Poppins mug. Is that correct, Dora? And um, this is a situation where their willingness to accept, they were willing to sell it for $20 or more, not for any, they weren't willing to sell it for a smaller amount. $100 was randomly selected. They were very lucky. And so we got this beautiful Mary Poppins mug and they got $100. George? Yes. From your perspective, is it important that they write the narrative or that they, or that you see it as an experimenter? Um, well, in these, I think I understand the question, like in the source dependence study, we kind of get, in a sense, we gave them the narrative. That is, they got the mug. Some of the people were told that they had received the mug because they had done well on a test or that because they won a contest. But in this study, um, we don't know whether it's important that they generated the narrative because we only looked at self-generated narratives. So, so what I didn't mean so much if they generated, but it's like, suppose I tell you, suppose it's, it's a mug that my wife gave me and I hate it. Yeah. And, and if you ask me to think about it, that wouldn't affect me. But once I've told you it's, it's my wife's gift, then I, I feel like it would be inappropriate for me to sell it. So it's not the narrative, but it's like this closing. So the experiment. Either way, it's going to lead to lead to marital discord, I suspect. But um, it's you know it, it is possible that um, putting it down on paper had a, had an effect, and that people already had narratives for some of the objects, but it was something about writing it down that was important. I um, on the other hand, I. Well, first, I'm not sure if I'm really answering your question still, but second, when we com when we compare the hats, when we compare the meaningful hat and the unmeaningful hat and the hat experiment, we didn't. I the results that we observed, I don't think were really significant with that with what you're articulating, because I think the story that you're articulating would probably predict that the impact of the narrative should be greater for a significant hat than for a miscellaneous hat. Is that true? Yeah, I think so. Okay. But, but most more than proposing an alternative, I, I'm trying to understand if, if you think the phenomenon is about how you perceive things or how, how you worry that you will be perceived by others. Okay. I mean, it would be interesting to have them write it down, but not share it, right? And um, whether, um, Dor, I assume you're taking notes, that, um, that would be a nice follow-up study. Um, so. Yeah, uh, I, I was just gonna, I, to me, it isn't totally clear that you'd find that difference that you predict, because if something's significant to me, it's maybe significant because I already have a narrative. Exactly. It's not, it's not doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's not doing well, anything, the, but, but then when you, but when you say do this thing at don't matter for, then it's like, even ex ante, I could easily easily see the opposite prediction, which is that you're already you're yeah. already at you're already at peak capacity. Your dose is already maxed out in the one condition, not the other. Right, um, ex post. That's our inter that's the interpretation that we offer in the experiment. But we we went into it expecting that the narrative would have, have a bigger impact on the meaningful item. When we didn't observe that, we. Um, 
our, the explanation we came up with after the fact is exactly yours, that people probably already have a fairly developed narrative for the more significant objects. Here's from the list condition. The, they list, they said the mug is white, there's black writing, it has a side handle, it's easy to carry, microwave safe. Their willingness to accept in for this mug was $15 and they, we randomly selected 40. So they, we got this mug. I love that we don't have to say out loud that I am your favorite child and which is kind of a narrative in itself, I suppose. And um, they got $40 and we got this gorgeous mug. Um, all right, sample and estimation strategy. They were, um, oh, 110 subjects, 14 in study one and 96 in study two out of the 1,493 participants were deemed invalid. That's 7.4% of the sample, mostly because they didn't supply a valid photo of a mug. Um, and we, since the um, selling prices are truncated at 100 in, one, in study one and 300 in study two, we use a Tobit approach to analyze the data. So the treatment coefficient captures the change in observed selling prices below the limit, as well as the change in the probability of selling. And if you ask me any statistical questions, I'm gonna turn it over to Dor. All right, so here's the bottom line. In the, um, what are these error bars, Dor? Those are 95% uh, bootstrap confidence interval. Okay. Um, these are, um, this is willing, willingness to accept. These are the selling prices. Um, top coding, people who said, I won't sell it in the mug condition. I won't sell it at $100. We top coded them as willing to sell at 100 at our maximum price. And same thing for the hat. You can see that the effects are bigger for the hat than for the significant mug. And they seem to be a bit bigger. You'll see this in the regression tables for the miscellaneous hat than for the significant hat. Here, it doesn't look like the narrative condition has a significant effect, but it does. Um, Dora, you want to explain that? Yes. So um, what we're seeing here does not actually reflect exactly the Tobit regressions, right? So we uh, top code uh, Instead of doing the Tobit regression, we top code those subjects who are unwilling to sell. And so this is a, a downward bias estimate, right? Because they, that's essentially a censored, censored sample. So uh, what, and so when we're, sens when uh, under this kind of biased estimation, the effect is uh, less pronounced. Um, and also just a quick comment about the difference between the mug, uh, the mug um, treatment effect and the ad treatment effect is that in part at least that mechanically due to the a smaller a maximal price on the on the MPL. And so we have a smaller scope there to capture the effect. So it's not necessarily the difference between the mag and the ad, but and mostly the difference between the, the multiple prices that's, that's given us a different effect sizes. And at this point, you're probably wondering why um, I'm presenting and it's not Dor presenting since he knows the paper so much better than I do. Okay, um, Shane. George, can I ask yeah, both of you, uh, and it's kind of an annoying question, but uh, I, I think I agree with your interpretation of this. You see this as an elevation of the red bars rather than the depression of the blue bars. But I could imagine a third condition where people did nothing, right? Like I'm wondering whether listing something actually depresses the valuation of it. You said take a mug and then measure how long it is and weigh it and whatever. And it's like, this, like I just feel less good about it. So I see this as a depression of the blue bars rather than elevation of the red bars, um, or maybe uh, both. Yeah. I, lo I love that. Like, um, all right, we, that's our second new study that we are going to run. It's a fantastic suggestion because um, we, of course, think it is a narrative effect, but we don't, you're, you're absolutely right that we don't know that. Um, do you agree, Dor? 
I do. I, I think that the, like the reason originally we did not we did not include such condition is that we were afraid of uh, you know different effort levels, right? So not doing anything compared to doing a task might might uh, mean something. And also, the other thing we were worried is that if you just let na people naturally you know just think about their item naturally, it could go like my sense at least it, some of them would be uh, engaged in. Uh, in the type of analytical thinking, right? That's more uh, that that's associated with list, and some of them uh, with uh, narrative thinking. So not telling them what to do, I think I'm not sure. Like it is a baseline, but maybe it would represent the, the proportion of people that naturally engage in narrative thinking. So we weren't sure exactly what to make of of that comparison. But I, yeah, but I I think it's a fantastic idea. Okay. We also looked at people who were unwilling to sell, which in the mug experiment was that meant they were unwilling to sell for a hundred dollars or less. But in the hat experiment, it meant that they were unwilling to sell for three hundred dollars or less. And what you see is that um, the in the narrative in the narrative condition, there's a larger in each of these for. Um, the for the mug is a larger fraction who are unwilling to sell at any price below a hundred dollars um, as opposed to the list condition and for both of the hat conditions the miscellaneous hat and the significant hat we see the same pattern so this is a very conservative test um, we also asked them another question we asked them um how much would they require to trade the item? How much would they either be willing to pay if they wanted to, um, or how much would they require, need to be paid to trade the item for an equivalent new version of the mug or the hat? Mostly we got willingness to accept. Mostly we got um, selling amounts that they had to be paid. Not that many people were willing to pay, but that led to um, very, very similar results as the, res as the results on this slide and also the regression results that I'm going to show you. Sorry, is, Judge. Yeah. Sorry, George, can, can I just ask about the willingness to pay? I'm not clear what, what happened there. So if you're asking people, if you're willing, how much yeah, are you willing say, to pay yeah, to get a mug you, like this? You, have, you show me a particular mug and yeah. then I ask you, would you like to trade this for a new a new mug? If you would like to trade it for a new mug, then I ask you how much would you pay to trade it for the new mug? But if you said, no, I don't wanna trade it for a new mug, I like my, the mug I have, then how much would you need to be paid to, rep to give up your mug and get a new version of your mug? Do you understand? Yes, sir. thanks. Okay. Um, here's a... Um, um, cumulative density function of the different um, willingness to WTAs. And in the mug condition there, in the mug experiment, there's only the two conditions. You can see here that the, if you look kind of at the 0.5, that would be the median. You can see the medians are very, very different here. And up um, these values are how, what fraction are unwilling to sell and you can see that in the narrative condition um, is, sorry, a higher fraction of subjects who are unwilling to sell at any of the prices below 100 than in the um, list condition. Here you can see the, um, this is the, the solid lines are the lines for the significant mug and the prices are higher, not so, sorry, hat, the prices, not surprisingly, are higher for the significant hat than for the miscellaneous hat. But for both the significant hat and the miscellaneous hat, you can see differences in prices across the distribution, including at the median, and also differences in unwillingness to sell that you've already seen on the previous slide. Here are the Tobit um, estimates. Um, with um, this is with different controls. This is study one looking at 
um, willingness to accept or selling prices for the mug. And you can see that with different types of um, controls, like um, either looking at um, all observations here, whether they're valid or not, in these two columns, uh, only valid observations, controlling or not controlling for demographics, you can see that the effect is very robust. And that seems to be about a, these are not logs, correct, um, Dor? So the, the, this corresponds to about a 10% difference in WTA. A 10 percentage point, no, sorry, a $10 difference. Is that correct? $10, yeah. a $10 difference, sorry. And you can see that the differences are greater for the hat and they're also very robust. And when we looked at the, um, not surprisingly, the significant hat is more uh, value than the miscellaneous hat, which you see in these two columns, but the interaction effect is, was to our surprise, um, not significant, even though after the fact, we were able to come up to, with a story to explain that. Here's um, log um, logit estimates of the narrative effect on unwillingness to sell at any price that we gave them. And for the, um, and you can see, let's see, oh, these aren't, yes, these are not the logit estimates. These are the fraction. The most interesting thing here is you can see that if you look at the difference between the fraction of items that were either miscellaneous hats that were either miscellaneous or significant, you can see that um, the significant hat was much more, almost twice as likely to be inherited as compared to the miscellaneous hat and was less likely to be self-bought and was a bit more likely to be associated with a positive experience. Um, the significant hat was also more likely to be somehow connected to another person. And it was also more likely to be custom made. And it was also used more often. The it was also likely to be more expensive, like to have a higher, um, um, higher retail value. And it was more likely to have, it was likely to have been owned for a longer period of time. So that's the difference between the miscellaneous hat and the significant hat. And these are the results that the label refers to. These are the logistic regression results. And you can see that when we look at the binary variable, were they willing to sell um, at one of the prices that we gave them or not? You can see that in the narrative condition, they were substantially more, um, less likely to sell um, than in the list condition. And that's true for the hat, for the mug, and it's also true for the hat. And once again, they're less likely to sell the significant hat for any price below $300, but there's no interaction effect. When we look at the, um, when we control for some of the information that the subjects gave us about the item, like um, what do we find for the mug? we find that if they won the mug as a prize, that tended to lower their willingness to accept. If it was self-bought, they again, that lowered their willingness to accept. This, um, these are for only, these are interactions between the experimental condition and whether it was positive, negative, or both. And we see that, um, neither it being neither it being negative or both, like um, 
it seems like a positive narrative lowered the va the value. Is, is that how you'd interpret this door? Right. So the uh, om the omitted category here in this uh, so in the first section the omitted category was receiving the mug as a gift so uh, what you see here is the coefficients for the other categories right the omitted category is the the is the most common one so the most common one was, uh, most common like possession category was gift and that's what omit that's the omitted one relative to that a prize and self buying the getting the mug as a price or self buying it reduced valuation. And in the experience column, the 1.3, um, we see that, so the, the uh, uh, positive story is omitted. And we see that relative to that, um, a negative or both negative and positive story did not have a significant effect, but not having a story at all. So answering uh, NA to that question, I was associated with the lower value. Can I, can I jump in with a question? Some of these characteristics of the narrative relate to a couple of questions that are showing up in the in the chat, which is, um, you know, have you thought about um, trying to equate what they're writing about, but trying to manipulate the process uh, by which they're writing? So, you know, one question is, you know, could you have them both say something about how they obtained it, but ones are listing features and ones are describing a narrative? And you know, do you think that would be enough to trigger this effect? Or do you think like simply listing the features would be enough to kind of cue the private narrative in their minds? So kind of going back to, you know, is it about what they're writing about or how they're doing it? I, do, I think it would be really interesting to <clears throat> run an experiment where we tried to get them to come up with different types of narratives. I'm not sure if that gets at your question. We, in, in this experiment, in these experiments, we, kind of led them to um, come up with a narrative about how they got the object. But it would be um, interesting, difficult to think exactly about how you do it on the fly, but um, it would be interesting to see whether try, kind of trying to encourage them to come up with different types of narratives, like how you got it, or maybe what it means to you, um, or um, I don't know what a, a I don't know what an attribute based narrative would look like, but maybe we could come up with something like that. So it would be all narratives, but we'd look at different types of narratives. Does that is that kind of what you're suggesting? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that that would be I think that'd be really interesting. Yeah, and I think just, I think some of the, yeah, just kind of wondering is again is it like what they're writing about, how much would is driven by that versus about just the process of writing a narrative. But I think those studies would be would be very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what else do we find? We find if it's related to occupation, at least for the mug, that's a negative. And if it's connected to another person, that's very, very positive. And more expensive things, that tends to in, uh, the narrative, let's see, oh, not surprisingly, things that are more, have a higher retail price, they elicits higher WTA. Um, same thing for custom made objects. We already kind of discussed this. And the longer they've owned it, this is consistent with the research I did with um, Michal Strahilovic, but um, it does appear that the longer they've owned it, the higher is their WTA for either the mug or the hat. George, can I ask a question about welfare implications here? Sure. Um, I, I was sort of, to me, it's not obvious that raising somebody's, I'm going to say compensation demanded, I hate the term WTA. That raising somebody's uh, conversation demanded makes them better off. Like I'm, I'm sort of imagining a case: you got to give a candle to one of two friends. One has a one has a WTP and conversation demanded of twenty bucks. They're both equal. The other one has a WTP of ten and a conversation demanded of thirty. Who do you give the candle to? Um, and it isn't obvious at all to me that you give it to the person with the higher willingness to accept. Nor is it obvious to me that, that by raising my willingness to accept, you may be better off. I just know I'm just scared to break the mug, but I'm not better off <laughs> by having a higher WTA. I mean, I, th I have a feeling you know where, what my answer is going to be, which is- Thank you, don't. I, I don't. Okay, that um, if you were deciding who to give it to, um, and you might look at um, WTP, although you would worry about whether they were differentially wealthy. So that, um, that's a problem with WTP. But if you were thinking about who you were going to, whose mug you were going to take from them, then 
it seems to me that WTA might be more appropriate, again, with worries about um, wealth, wealth differences between the two people. Wouldn't, doesn't that seem kind of reasonable to you? Maybe, but I mean, I, I'm imagining you could tell me, I, tell, tell an Arab about this. And it's like, oh my God, my grandmother gave this to me. And it's like, oh Jesus, what if I break it? Like, have, have you maybe better off by, by, by making me have a narrative about <laughs> elevates my, my WTA? I don't think you, I don't feel like you have. Whereas it, feel, it seems to me like you're suggesting that you, you are, that this is positive welfare implications of raising WTA. I don't, um, the, um, in the sense that we are raising the value they put on something that they own. Well, you're raising the value of losing something they own. That's different. Yeah. I don't, um, I don't know. It reminds me of um, the, jo the famous Joni Mitchell song that you don't know what you have till it's gone. <laughs> and I could imagine that somebody's welfare, that maybe a bunch of people's welfare was increased. Like I think about some of the artwork I've purchased over the years. And if you asked me like, where is it in your house? I couldn't even tell you. And the, um, and I never look at it. Like, um, on the other hand, if you said, um, how much would you sell this painting for? And, and then I kind of took it in and I, um, and I reported some probably high selling price to you. I think I would for some period of time that would increase my appreciation of the painting and it might mar make me marginally better off. So my intuition I think is a little bit different from yours. I, I do think that coming up with these narratives may have been beneficial welfare wise. Conclusions, um, narrative thinking, writing a story as opposed to listing attributes has a large and statistically significant effect on WTA. I don't think I need to go into that. I've already shown you the results. Um, the impact of narratives on valuations might help to explain a range of real world phenomena. The, um, for example, um, why do we generally give gifts um, as opposed to giving money at holidays? Like the kind of traditional economic logic says that um, we should give money because people can use the money to buy whatever they want, which will inevitably be something better than um, what we're going to buy for them. Uh, Colin Kammerer wrote a paper a long time ago um, proposing a signaling explanation for why we give non-cash gifts, but maybe this um, research um, provides a different explanation that like getting something as a gift creates a narrative and makes it meaningful because it's um, hopefully if the person who receives the gift likes the gift giver, it creates this kind of positive connection, this kind of synergistic connection. Um, it's been found that non-monetary incentive gifts have a bigger impact on worker productivity than uh, monetary gifts. I, ages ago, I did a uh, study with Emily Hazley where a Pittsburgh bank send, sent their high worth customers um, kind of random gifts. And that had a big impact on their actually ba bank balances. If they got these random gifts, they increased their bank balances. Although we did not have a control condition where we sent people money. Souvenir stores, merchandise misspelled, merchandise stands at ball games, fan memorabilia at concerts. All of these, uh, all of these are kind of location specific goods which are sold for higher prices than you can get the same goods at online or at out of context general stores. And maybe that's because you know, let's say that you buy the CD at the concert. Like, I guess people don't buy CDs anymore, but if you buy the CD at the concert, then um, like this is the CD that um, 
I got at when I went to the concert, there's like a narrative associated with it. I'm sure there's a lot of other phenomena that are connected. Um, well, so thank you. Um, looks like we're almost out of time, but we're really out of time. Any last question? Or do we have? All right, well, thank you so much. You, you gave us um, an amazing number of good ideas for follow-up studies and please, Email us if you have other reaction, other suggestions, and especially ideas for follow-up studies. But yeah, thanks a lot. And and thank you, George. That was really great. And thanks to all of our panelists for being here, and thanks to our audience for being here as well. Uh, we'll do this again next week. Have a good weekend. Great. Bye.